Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Today we have another flare interview, this time with uh, Dungdraw Three Kingdoms, who unsurprisingly is flared in the Three Kingdoms period of Chinese history. Um, welcome. Hello, nice to be here. And today we've got a very specific subtopic. We're not talking about the Three Kingdoms period in general as such, um, but specifically at how the Ming era novel, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, has influenced the way that the Three Kingdoms period is talked about in popular discourse, especially online. <laughs> so if you could just start us off, nevertheless, with a very brief overview of what we mean by the Three Kingdoms period, because technically the Three Kingdoms actually come into it a while in. So the Three Kingdoms in a lot of in games and sort of fictions usually starts in either 184 with the Yellow Turban Rebellion acting as a preview for the collapse of the Han, or 190 where the Wall of Dongzhou uh, seized power and then other war warlords started to emerge to rise against him. And then sort of a lots of warlords fought for regional control, but by 220... 219, it had become three main factions who started to declare, we actually have the son, we are actually son of heaven, we're the legitimate empire. And so it, they battled for control with a long stalemate till 263, Xu Han fell, and then sort of 284, the Jin, Jin united the land by conquering Wu. So you got a bloody civil war for about nearly 100 years. But for most people, it will start before it actually emerges in the Three Kingdoms, because the novel, frankly, gets it just stops paying attention after two, three, four. It starts going skip, 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 skip. Yeah, which is you know, it's a, it's a fascinatingly ironic thing. But I suppose you know, it it's a thing that we'll need to get into in more detail. So instead of trying to um, get down into a puddle too quickly, uh, what is the romance of the Three Kingdoms? Uh, it was a work of fiction by Lu Guangzhong uh, about a thousand years later that took a lot of narratives that had already built up for centuries, including other works of fiction like the creation of Theo Chan was far earlier than the novel itself. And it built an, it turned it into a consistent entertaining narrative where Xu Han versus way. Zhu Han, the noble continuation of the Han line with benevolence and loyalty and kindness versus a cruel and powerful empire that was illegitimate, uh, unfilial, uh, sort, it, and it created a narrative of sort of great jewels, grand strategies with almost people who could almost command the heavens but not quite that even as brilliant as say someone like Zhuge Liang is he will be denied by rainfall or sort of his own incompetent emperor or and so it's a tragic tale it loves a character arc with uh, sort of people's flaws bring them down and that the land being united will become divided once again that this is a constant flow of history and sort of this is the Three Kingdoms a lot of people know via games or films or with the grand heroes, the jewels, the mad, almost magical strategy. So with that in mind, we can, I suppose, start getting into a lot of the specifics. And one of them, which you brought up with me before we started, um, is something that you didn't actually bring up just now, which is, of course, the Third Kingdom, Wu, which seems to play a very peripheral role in the novel. How does that end up influencing the way that people talk about Wu, not just in terms of its relative importance, but also um, in sort of, I suppose, more moralistic, qualitative terms? Well, one of the things it does with Wu is it cuts back on its campaigns. So Wu becomes the passive kingdom in the South. So you can ignore it for chapters uh, and sort of, it's the junior partner of Xu Han, the unreliable, treacherous partner that sometimes will attack Xu, like the 219 Great Betrayal. 
where it seizes the land of Jing from the Xu Han and denies and really hampers Xu Han's dreams. It's, of course, Xu Han would never have taken any lands by betrayal, even though its very foundation is taking over lands from its host. Uh, you've got, it's, it constantly in the novel talks about raising troops, but never quite does it. It, in fact, when it, when Sun Quan decides to become emperor, they're actually talking about, should we invade Wei? No, let's just become emperor and now's our time to do this and become our own power. Uh, but those who like Wu, sort of, it's sort of, they don't see that as sort of a passive betraying kingdom that, but they talk of it as a unambitious, that it just wants it to protect its regional identity, that it's uh, un. Whereas the Sao family and the Lu family are ambitious, causing all sorts of suffering. They're just protecting themselves. They're just family feelings. It's, uh, and Dynasty Warriors very much plays into that. It's very much, we are family. We are sort of a group who love each other, respect each other, and sort of don't quite have that driving sense of we must conquer the land, which has no connection to its historical self. Yes, I, presumably then Wu is in the actual historical sense, looking back before the novel then, was actually a considerably more active contender in, in the conflict. Arguably, in fact, it was the second power after Very Wei and so. not... Yeah. It had the resources, sort of... It, it, Xu Han was reduced after 219 to essentially one province and one attack route. That's all they... So it made them a limited power, and at some points, Wei actually just didn't bother worrying about them. They were not a threat. All their fo- their focus would be on other threats, like the rather larger power to the south, with Jing, Jiao, uh, Wu itself as a base, and its southern expansions, including an attempt to invade Taiwan, all ways to get more resources to try and fill the, res- the resource gap with the much larger Wei power to the north. Uh, the novel, for example, between uh, Chibi, where it's sort of Wei attacks the alliance of the new alliance of Shu Lu Bei, i.e. the future Shu Han, and Sun Quan, the future Wu, uh, in 208, to Sun Quan's death in 251, sorry, 251, it has a grand total of four attacks by Wei, Wu at Wei, just four. Over 40 de- four decades, you get a hot, just f- those four attacks. So it makes it passive. They're not a threat if they're only attacking once every decade, etc. And two of them, one of them's a, and they spend much of their time complaining about Xu Han, and the other's a supporting act of Xu Han that fails miserably very, very quickly. But during that, I did a quick run through of Sun Quan's chance bio and the Wei rulers' biographies, and there's at least thirteen invasions from Wu onto Xu Han during those, sorry, onto Wei during those, during those decades. It's a considerable gap between four and thirteen, and there were other ones that were not in those biographies I'm aware of. Which Xu Han, Xu Han did have pat sort of Zhuge Liang's five campaigns get turned by the novel into six as, and they really the way it's really scared of his attacks despite his having one province and so that becomes the major focus it's what the novel focuses on it's what people assume the main threat is despite Chu Han could only do limits limited resources, one route, whereas Wu often raised multiple armies to attack multiple points. At one point, Man Chang's worried that Wu are com- attack coming at them year in, year out. But that's not the one people know. That's They don't really see the aggression, the constant aggression. They see the gaps. They see the, well, they're attacking Taiwan, so they weren't interested in going north. 
Yeah, yeah which is um, a bit of a stretch, I think we could probably agree. <laughs> so, I mean, there are oh, God, a whole host of novel-related things, but I feel like the most obvious thing to hit home here is, of course, um, this eulogising approach to the Kingdom of Shuhan, which, especially in the wake of Mongol rule over China, as well as the earlier uh, Jurchen rule over the north, um, was easy to present as this great underdog um, because you have the, this major state, the Ming, which emerges from a sort of underdog position. Um, but as you've noted, um, especially on the subreddit, there's a sort of paradoxical element to this in that a lot of the discourse is shaped by directly attacking the novel's own straw man and creating just as bad a distortion as following the novel directly. So it's a lot of people, when they come from the novel, it's they look, they come in thinking Han is awesome. They were the, a re- really noble kingdom. They were all these powerful, almost deific uh, figures like Guan Yu, Zhi Ge Liang. Then they discover... History wasn't like that. And so you've got Liu Bei becomes Mr. Backstabber, with, who just keeps going on and on about the Han. Guan Yu becomes, he did nothing apart from killing that guy one time. But really, he was useless. Look how he fell. Zhu Ge Liang became, he won no campaigns. He had no strategic ability, which is all wrong. Zhu uh, Ge Liang did win some campaigns. He may have been tact. There is an argument he was tactically inflexible, but he was uh, innovative with his inventions, strong a military administrator. He held his armies together, and he had successes in the field. Uh, but it becomes about how he was a failure because he didn't overcome these larger armies in a defensive position because uh, he. He could not live up. He cannot live up to a novel reputation. So people feel that he's overrated because he. Uh, and you get all sorts of kickbacks among, particularly the amateur community, about how Guan Yu stole kills or how Wei Yan, when he mutinied after Zhu Ge Liang's death, was a victim of a Zhu Ge Liang conspiracy. To, that did not, that when he was the brave, overlooked figure that, rather than a rather arrogant, troublesome, uh, will draw a sword on you if he disagrees with you. Uh, headstrong figure that just occasionally made misjudgments like, I should cut off the army's retreat and try to claim military authority. Which most emperors would go, this is a problem to deal with. Not, oh yes, I, re- uh, one, I appreciate your wonderful idea to take control. But it's sort of uh, an early fiction people discover through games like Dynasty Warriors is that in the novel, Guan Yu is the brave warrior who goes out and kills the warrior Hu Zhong, the a mighty officer of Dong Zhou, who leads the first army against the coalition. And he defeats a starved army of Sun Jian. He defeats a lot of champions set against him, and then Guan Yu dares to volunteer to the shock of his superiors to fight this mighty warrior, goes out and comes back with the head before the wine has cooled down. It is a wonderful scene and a way of opening up how mighty Lu Bu is going to be and how mighty Guan Yu is in killing such a warrior. In history... Uh, what people learn is Sun Jian killed Don, killed Hu Zhong. The problem with that is Sun Jian didn't actually kill him. It was a kill in a battle among troops. And Hu Zhong was not a warrior. He was more an administrative officer in a subordinate role, trying to keep control of an army that was in fighting itself, which then gave Sun Jian the opportunity to break the siege and and destroy the army. 
but what people hear is Guan Yu, ki- Guan Yu stole this kill, as if Guan Yu personally threatened the author to do this, and then uh, that all you have to do is replace Guan Yu with Sun Jian, and you've got the exact same type of battle, the exact same situation, the exact same uh, problem. It's, it's constantly with Wu figures, it's how individually they might be denied credit or changed, but no one, they don't look, people don't tend to look at the administ- the overall changes and they don't see necessarily that moment where the novel inadvertently or deliberately uh, hypes up the flaws of Xu Han beings to make a better story. Like Guan Yu's fall becomes all about his arrogance that he cannot foresee what, that he's a tired warrior who gets frustrated at his at any idea that he's slowing down, that he's not as good as what he once was. He's blithely ignoring that Wu might be a threat, and thus he is an arrogant fool brought down by his own ego. And there's some historical basis to that, because Guan Yu was an arrogant figure who perhaps could have handled better things better if he'd been a bit less arrogant. He might, but he was aware that Wu were a threat. He only reacted when he thought that Wu's commander in chief, who he knew was a threat, had been had become mortally, really badly ill, and that Wu were having to reshuffle their ranks, reorganize their army. He still left the defense there. That it was just that Wu brought in such a strong campaign that clever campaign that took out all of his defensive options and his mistreatment of subordinates were more of an issue. But so, to understand Xu Han, it, yes, you have to bring in that Liu Bei was an opportunist who betrayed, who wheeled and dealed with other warlords, who was willing to backstab, who was not always a kind, benevolent figure. But he was more than, but also in the novel, he's also a moron. His strategy in his final campaign is compared unfavorably to children. This it's, But in his history, he was a wily commander, uh, a brilliant politician, had a great eye for PR. And so when it gets reduced to telling, trying to tell the audience how much Liu Bei is a backstabber, how much of an opportunist, is, and so he's not a man of virtue, you're giving a skewed version of Liu Bei and sort of what his kingdom represented, what his, why people followed him. Sort of, uh, I was reading, I, I did a pre, there's a book out on how Guan Yu uh, afterlife reputation was f- being uh, shaped by religion, legends, and, uh, and so the author did a quick rundown of Guan Yu's life. And the emphasis on it is how Guan Yu and co were, weren't really about loyalists or but were opportunists. And uh, there were mistakes made in the overview because of the, it's not the person's expertise. Uh, it's not the year itself. So he makes some errors like uh, Wei persuaded some of Guan Yu's subordinates to defect when it was Wu. But it's the summary is, yes, Chen Xiao talked about Guan Yu's loyalty, and that he's already been captured by legend. But Chen Chao also talked about his arrogance. We do have Guan Yu being loyal, loyal, rejecting better opportunities to stick with, well, at that point, a very minor warlord who just kept, kept running about, cut, unable to find the base. He could have taken a really cushy number with Cao Cao. He was being given rewards, he was getting gift. please stay, please stay, I'd love you to stay. And yet, when you left that, he handed back all the rewards he'd been given and went off to the uncertainty of of Liu Bei, of serving Liu Bei. Hmm. I mean, to, to sum up a, a lot of what's been said, I mean, it's, it's interesting that there's an extent to which actually some of this sort of backlash comes from within the novel itself. It's not just the idea that the novel's presentation of Shuhan is 
is um, too romantic and that the historical version is much more cynical. It's also actually perhaps the assumption going in that the novel depicts Shuhan very romantically and discovering that even the novel doesn't go quite as far as the imagined notion in a way. Yeah, it's... Uh, the problem is, I think a lot... Part of the problem with the novel is there's a belief that it is 70 parts history and 30 parts fiction, which is sort of true within limitations. But it's... When sort of people with... The novel for, say, Wei, the gen, Wei Yan's death wants to make it abundantly clear that Wei Yan is a traitor. He... He, he literally shouts out, he shouts out, I am a rebel, I am... Uh, Zhu Ge Liang foresees all this, it is 100% clear that Wei Yan is a dirty, dirty traitor. So, in history, there is more ambiguity, because the Shu Han records actually state all Wei Yan wanted to do was have command of the army. He had no intention of defecting or seizing control of the empire. He wasn't as such a traitor. It doesn't clear Wei Yan of of bad behaviour. He's put in what might be called the traitor's list of biographies. He's, uh, it's, he, uh, it makes clear Wei Yan's got an ego the size of a planet, that he was a troublesome figure that got other people sacked, that, again, took out a sword on another officer who he didn't like. But for when people come from the novel and they see the line about him not seeking rebellion, what they see is Wei Yan must be a victim of rep- of sort of conspiracy that sort of... Zhu uh, Liang was behind it, it was... when he wasn't. Zhu Liang went, if Wei Yan disagrees with you or to retreat when I die, just let him be. Zhu Liang did not predict Wei Yan's interpretation of that would be, I'll just go around the back and burn the roads of retreat so everyone has to stay. But it's people kind of blame Shuhan figures for the fact that there's romanticization of them. And so sort of when uh, you've got academic works looking at how the romanticization starts before the novel, they sometimes start blaming the records themselves because it's too positive. When, uh, for example, Zhu Ge Liang's, Chen Chao's summarization of Zhu Ge Liang is. A uh, brilliant minister, an able has been such a great administrator, his laws were fair, but he addresses the uh, military failures. And somewhat, it's it's against the odds, but it's also about how Zhu Ge Liang is tactically inflexible. And so, some, he's, because Zhu Ge Liang's reputation grew even further, he was a worshipped figure, he was uh, the ideal scholarly statesman, he got people either looking at why Chen Shao was not praising him enough and what bias Chen Shao has, or as you more get in the modern day, sometimes it's why is Chen Shao saying these nice things about Zhu Ge Liang? It's he must, this must be bias, it's Zhu Ge Liang must have done something underhand to build that reputation, and it's, or that Chen Shao was in awe of a legend. It's Chen Chao was carefully balanced in what he was saying, and he was writing uh, for the Jin Dynasty, where Zhu Ge Liang was awesome and completely legitimate, might not necessarily go down well with the Sima. They wanted Zhu Ge Liang to look good, yes, because it then made their ancestor Sima Yi look good, and a little less bad for how badly Sima Yi performed in the campaigns. But it's... You kind of either got people dashing off to... The history doesn't ma- match up with the history. Sorry, the history doesn't match up to the novel, thus the history is wrong, which I do sometimes get as sort of on forums is, well, Lu Bei was a saint, but they didn't dare put that in the history because they were scared of it or that sort of there was an agenda against uh, the Shu Han figures. Or that uh, particularly when the Shu Han a particular problem with Xu Han is the history about them is quite bad. They never they established a records department, 
but they didn't properly fund it. Uh, leading historians were used on other posts like education, like uh, Chia Xiao, the mentor of Chen Xiao, uh, was very much in the education role. And that's sort of, there isn't supplementary history works that could be borrowed to add to it to fill in the gaps. Whereas Wei and Wu, you've got all sorts of his, historical works created by those of the time that were drawn upon by Pei, Pei Zongzi uh, when he was adding annotations. So Xu Han, you've got an emperor, a long-lived empress whose life is basically was born, got married, uh, had ch possibly had children, lived to see Xu Han fall, and that's it. That is basically all we know of her. We know more about her mother because Yu Han, uh, a way scholar, had to thought, oh, I best explain why there's a connection between the Shi Hao clan of Wei and Lu Shan of Shu, particularly when uh, Shi Hao Ba, the Wei general, defected to Shu Han after the Sima coup. And so it goes, and we know, we know the age of the, the empress's mother, we know the circumstances of the marriage, we know that sort of she mourned her uh, Shi Hao Yan when he died fighting Shu Han, and we get a rather moving incident where Lu Shan tries to reassure Shi Hao who's got an uncertain rep reception in Shu Han, of oh, your son is of your blood as well. We are relatives. You are you are my relative." As a way to reassure, and it's uh, it's. You just get all these mixed receptions that Xu Ge Liang is now the bad guy, the failure you got. That if a viewpoint, if the histories don't match up to the viewpoint, you can either blame Chen Shao was in, uh, already in awe of a legend and was biased, and thus I with this real history and showing you the truth by reading the text uh, and ignoring the flim flam or you've got Chen Xiao wasn't praiseworthy it would be enough and so and so try to fill that in as to how Zhu Ge Liang is awesome or Guan Yu is awesome and trying to build it up from that there was a couple of things you brought up that that rather grabbed me oh one let's start with that but perhaps it doesn't need to be too long um is simply as you mentioned, even if you know it was Guan Yu who defeated um, uh, what was his name again, uh, Zhou Jing in in battle, it wouldn't have been Guan Yu himself. And as, as was the case, it was actually Sun Jian. And again, it wasn't Sun Jian himself. I mean, to what extent is this is a unique problem of the novel that individuals are attributed the achievements of well large group efforts. Or is this really sort of an extension of, of um, the original historical record in the first place? How much is there an exaggeration of individual roles? Uh, it's partly the novel loves a duel. It loves an officer on officer kill because that's entertaining. It's dramatic. It's So instead of rare officer on officer kill, kills or this guy was directly responsible for it, it's you, most battles, a lot of battles are open with a duel or a big dramatic fight 1v1 or even 3v1 in Lu Bu's case to show how powerful he is that he's able to hold off these mighty warriors. Or you've got Grant. Now sometimes uh, say the killing of Sang Hei by an ambush is directly attributable to Zhu Ge Liang organised a retreat and ambushed him. But it loves a and so you've got that in the history records, but the novel loves direct kills via cleverness or that constantly outwitted, driven to death by despair at being constantly outwitted. Zhuge Liang literally debates a guy to death, a guy who actually in historical records was not at that battle and lived for several years afterwards as a kindly minister. But, you know, death by debate, you remember that. It's a great way to show Zhuge Liang's abilities. It's... It's a great way to show War's ability if he's constantly killing someone rather than, say, Guan Yu, in the history record, gets one officer kill. 
and riding through an army, killing him, riding your way back out, is impressive. But when you've got the novel where he's where it's officer on officer kill, one kill doesn't sound impressive. So really, Guan Yu sounds like a fake compared to this. Uh, instead of killing just Yan and Yang, he kills Wen Chao, he kills Hu Jiang, he fights, he kills five gate guards just to get away from Cao Cao. One kill, not really impressive, uh, because so he must be a fraud rather than actually one kill is really impressive in the context he was fighting in. Yeah, uh, the other thing that came to mind was, um, funnily enough, a, a Twitter ad- interaction you had with a different moderator recently, um, where it, it was brought up, there's, there seems to be almost a certain impression among um, a lot of people who like sort of amateur historians on the internet that, in a way, there, there's a lot of people who, who view history as trivia, so to speak. You know, it, it doesn't matter if it's true, so long as it is interesting or novel. Uh, novel in the sense of, you know, new, as opposed to what we've been talking about. But nevertheless, I mean, does going back to things like kind of reacting to the romantic image derived from the novel not being matched either by the novel or even less by the history, I mean, to what extent do you think that it is sort of second opinion bias? It's the notion that the thing I had assumed was wrong, and therefore the first and most obviously contradictory viewpoint is most correct. Yeah, it's you see one fact or a little line, and then you build around from the basis you already think you know. It's you already know that say you already know that Xu Ge Leong mistreats Wei Yan. You already know that the novel is biased towards one faction. But you don't look deeper beneath it, like what were the structural changes the novel made? What uh, if Guan Yu didn't kill Hu Zhong, as, Zhong, as we mentioned? Uh, then what else about that entire battle was wrong? What does it say about the type of warfare? It's just I've got this thing. I understand that officer on kill on officer kills were regular things. I know, think I know by games and by cultural image how it's going, how this war wars were fought. I've got all these little facts or ideas in my head that aren't actually accurate, but you think are, and so you take this one thing, this one little bit of trivia, and you shape everything around it without exploring deeper into what actually else was wrong, what actually had changed. Yeah, and I mean, in in a way, this is true of so many periods of history and public perceptions of them. But I mean, in in a period like the Three Kingdoms, where it is simultaneously such a a rich period his, historiographically, but also such a cultural cornerstone with its own little sort of literary history, it's it becomes especially acute and especially obvious. Um. So this, I, I would, I should say actually that sort of with Western audiences when they uh, come at it from games or TV show, they don't always know that there's an actual real history. They, we, I've had twice and ask historians, was this era real? And for which I frankly managed to con the rest of you into thinking it was. But uh, yeah. oh. or you actually get sort of on gaming things is. Uh, we don't know the history. This is like King Arthur. It's a just romantic tales that there's no records. There's no, we, all we have is sort of the novel or folklore. There's not this, always this concept that yes, there's this novel, but there's a history behind it that there were written records. There were people who lived through it, who wrote about it. Yeah. So, it is an interesting paradox though, because I think it, in a sense, you, you, it goes against what is in some ways the common perception that all folklore must have some grain of truth behind it, which is in itself a bit of an urban legend. No, people people can make things up entirely. But paradoxically, when this is one of the cases where that's not the case, yeah, it's they, the side that goes, yeah, it is made up. That... They, they sort of beg there was an era, there was sort of Guan Yu was real, but that we have no, they think there's no historical record of the time that is sort of like say like the king arthur or sort of 
there was someone there, but we know nothing about them because and all we got is these works of fictions. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure why specifically the Three Kingdoms I is thought of, despite sort of there being Roman histories about the or or the Greek histories that the China didn't have a histories for this period. But it's I think the romanization is such that the, they just kind of seem it's ancient, it's really past. They may not necessarily really have a head on the dates, but that it's clearly exaggerated. And so all there is is the legends that they, they don't actually know that anything historical was actually written. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's also another factor, which I mean, begins with R and ends with Acism. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, you know. Total War objections to why is there a Three Kingdoms game? One wonders how much of there wasn't history was really. I just don't want an Asian based game. Yeah. Because I well, you have brought up something that I was about to. Because we, we've been talking about games a few times, and, and I mean, the one that we, the two that we name dropped, are probably the most the two most famous properties regarding this, which are of course um, Koei's Dynasty Warriors series, and more recently uh, Total War Three Kingdoms. Rest in peace. Um, and both of these ultimately rely very heavily on the novel. I mean, Dynasty Warriors is a well, a very expanded upon adaptation of the novel. And Three Kingdoms, even though it does offer a more historical mode, is still very clearly structured around the novel and focuses very heavily on personalities that in some cases are unique to the novel. I do think this is necessarily a problem. Or, I mean, is it is it fine for you know, pieces of media to you know, just go with the literary product or even mix and match as Total War did? Uh, be honest, I don't actually mind it. I mean, at this point, the genie's out of the bottle. You're not... <laughs> where where there can be problems is people assume, say, the Dynasty Warriors Wei Yan with a mask and a speech impediment did not actually have a speech impediment and wear a mask. More unrealistic, sort of exaggerated ones, people get the idea this is fiction. Where there can be sort of more of a headache is where sort of games realise that the novel is biased. So they'll, and sort of, that it's not going to be so much fun for those that want to play as Wei if they're being, co- or woo, if they're being constantly told how wonderful Shu Han is. So they try to balance it out. They don't necessarily balance it out by historical version. It's more like, what if this novel version, you take out the bias, what do you end up with? So Cao Cao becomes this calm, calculating, brilliant hero of chaos who's, emo- who's not as emotional as others and is willing to sacrifice his reputation for the wider good. The historical Cao Cao was an emotional hothead. His own advisors, you've got instances of the demon going, I've got to deal with this <laughs> emotional breakdown. His one wife divorced him because he couldn't keep, because his inability to uh, keep it in his pants got his son killed. Another one is said to have co- written, I'm so sorry your son got executed. My husband is a hothead. It doesn't, he, he cared about his reputation. He wrote a poly- he sort of wrote an apology to explain his career, how he'd loyally ended up head of government, why he did his conquests. But the uh, game appeal, sort of the cultural image of Cao Cao didn't care, that Cao Cao was this calm, bravely taking on the criticism, that uh, he wasn't a bad guy, but he was just willing to take a reputational hit. That's kind of harder for sort of people to shift away from because it sounds accurate. It sounds accurate when the Jin dynasty were uniting the land because they were intellectually superior and all the others were morons, to be put it nicely. Uh, that Wu were, again, the Wu were passive. That Sun Chen was a scholarly figure, cautious, lacking, com- not rather than, say, a guy who saw big red danger and rushed towards it repeatedly, like, say, trying to fight tigers hand-to-hand or 
taking a scouting boat and sailing up to the arm, an enemy army to have a nice little look around and then getting shot at repeatedly. Uh, but it's it's sort of when they modern adapt it to sort of uh, be unbiased, but they don't look at, actually, what was this figure really like? Maybe we could build from there, but what was the novel figure like if you strip away the bias? That becomes more of a problem because it feeds into existing things while seeming historically accurate. <laughs> Do you think, though, that there's a case for arguing that actually these aren't so much attempts to comment on the history and more attempts to expand upon a literary tradition that doesn't have to be static? Yeah. And I honestly don't mind that, but sort of, uh, sort of Total War Three Kingdoms try to appeal by, look, we've hired a race the cre- cre- the the leading Western historian uh, to make it seem historically accurate. It's. I would rather, in some ways, they just went. We drawn upon the novel a bit of history, and we created our own thing, sort of to modernise it because the novel values do not always age well. Louvet tossing his son, baby son, because he they didn't want his general to uh, risk his life for his a baby. Doesn't necessarily look so good in tw- two thousand twenty two, <laughs> but. Like you want to see them adapt, sort of. I love. I the novels like to downplay women. So if games can bring forward to life the role of women in the era, and make people think, ah, oh, that women weren't just staying at home. They were. Yes, they weren't war, usually warriors, but they were politically powerful figures. Like I've written about, Lady Wu was sort of. For two years, the regent who dictated Wu's independence, the Sun State's independence, and that gave Sun Quan a platform later when he became older to remain independent from the Sao regime. But I like that. I like seeing how modern games and adaptions make their own tales from it. I I don't ne- I don't mind if they're inaccurate or I mean. I love laser fans. That may not be accurate in the history, but give me a laser fan and I'll enjoy shooting a thousand. But they've got... They're not meant to be accurate. And I don't... I like that sort of thing, culture, the culture build up, how they change, how they make their own thing with it. I don't mind that. It's more people kind of assume that it's not the novel... It's more historically accurate. If it sounds right, then it is right, rather than they've done their own thing. And that's where there's more trouble sometimes. Yeah. I, th- I mean, that sounds like a pretty logical end point, unless you've got anything more to add. Uh, I would say uh, people should enjoy the novel for what it is. Don't resent that it's inaccurate. Don't push against figures. Chiu Han figures weren't just opportunists opportunists or bad figures because if legend is saying says one thing it's not necessarily true that if you're looking at the era that the opposite is true the history is its own thing it's separate the two and enjoy it for what it is enjoy the novel for its fantastical tales enjoy the history for its human complexities and its uh the limitations of human humans, the bit, things the novels don't cover, like uh, all the little factions that uh, the novel writes out because it's got to fit it in 120 chapters, all the politics and literary that the novel, again, the novel likes battles, and it's great entertaining battles. Just, just enjoy them for what they are, and but keep them separate. If you want to explore, you've read the novel, the games, and want to explore the history, that's great. Come ask questions, uh, look at the records. But uh, just bear in mind, what you get is their own version, sort of its own tale, and not that the relation to history is, shall we say, rather more limited than 70, 30 accuracy. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed doing this.
Yes, and we may well see you again. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook, and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history. (laughs) 